Hello, I am award-winning crime fiction author T.G. Campbell and I'm here to tell you about an exciting new project. If you are a fan of the Victorian crime fiction series The Bow Street Society, which you probably are, otherwise you wouldn't be listening to this trailer, then we have an exciting announcement for you. On Saturday the 10th of July this year, we are launching the official Bow Street Society podcast. It will be available through many of the popular podcast apps, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts. Is it going to be on BBC Sounds? No. Tune in radio? Shh! On the podcast, we will give you news updates, give you background on the real world that the society operated in, as well as insight into the characters and stories in the series. And it will be released every other month. Also, in the first episode, we will be exclusively announcing the title of the forthcoming fifth book in the series, The Case of... You just said it. Did I? Yes. I just said The Case of... You just said it again. Oops. I'll tell the powers that be that I used a naughty word. They'll soon get rid of it for us. So, join Richard and myself by subscribing to the podcast wherever you found this trailer. Thank you, and see you on the 10th of July. You're going to be trouble, aren't you? There we go. I would very much like to introduce Tarni Campbell. Hello, Tarni. Hello. Hello. Tarni is the writer of the Bow Street Society series of uh, books, uh, the Bow Street Society podcast launches today so tell us a little bit about it so as i say the podcast is to help sort of introduce people to the books it also explores the world of agent 96 london so the reality of that world so to do with policing true crime society and technology um through interviews and also going back to the books there's also interviews with um characters as well directly to the characters from the books as well excellent so for those who haven't read the books, um, they are murder mysteries set in, well, initially the year 1896. What mm-hmm. would you say makes them unique compared to most crime fiction? Well, because most crime fiction has uh, one detective, or they might have a sidekick with that detective, um, and that's the only sort of detective you have throughout the series. If you do have a group of detectives, it tends to be the same, like three or four people. But with my books, it's different because depending on what case they get asked to investigate depends on who gets called in. So the combination of detectives who are assigned to a case changes with each mystery. So you never always have the same group of detectives investigating every single case. And so you've got a a group of characters. Um, How did they, how, how did you come up with them? Who came first? So... Miss Trent came first, so she is the clerk of the society, and she's the only one who officially who knows who all the members are, so that's for safety reasons. And so she is the one that will um, sort of interview new members. She's also the one who listens to um, people's cases who come into the society and ask them to investigate. And she will also do sort of the management of the members and facilitate meetings. So she came first because she's a very pivotal character, um, obviously, because she needs to basically run the show. And um, so she doesn't actually investigate crimes herself, but she will determine, based upon the um, details of the case, which members have the skills which she deems necessary to be able to solve that case. So, yeah, Miss Trent was the first one that came along as in terms of creation. Um, so you've got a, a, a group of how, how many roughly are there uh, in the society that we are aware of? There's about 15, I think, at the moment, roughly. Well, and have we seen all of them in the, what, first four or five books? Or, or, those, or those or those 15 yeah um probably no because there's um, one that if he appears just in the short story can't remember his name from last week but he's a piece <laughs> which is the jeweler yeah so he appears in a one short story that's the case of desperate deed um but he will eventually appear in one of the books um but there was obviously other members who i've yet to introduce who i do intend to introduce in the next few books as well so who was your inspiration? What, what, why do you like crime fiction so much and who inspired you to write your own? Um, I always loved um, Ad Christie, but I mean, when I was growing up, my mum and me and my sisters and fathers, I used to always watch sort of crime dramas on TV. So I grew up watching like Pyro, Diane Pascoe, Taggart, The Bill. Um, and <laughs> Miss Marple? I always, so, uh, the Bill. <laughs> uh, the Bill, we won't mention The Bill. What about Miss Marple? That was the only one I remember watching as a kid. 
Yeah, I enjoyed Miss Marple because when I, when I was younger, I used to read um, sort of Point of Horror and everything. Once you got past that, once you read all those in the library, my mum always sort of said, oh, why don't you try our Christie? So um, you then used to read our Christie books. Um, but personally, I always wanted to join the police. That was something that I really, really wanted to do. But unfortunately, due to my eyesight, I, that was never an option open to me. So I thought, well, the next best thing is to write about the police. Well, if you can't join them, I'd write about them. Um, so I initially, the first one I ever wrote in terms of crime like, fiction was a very bad screenplay um, called The Sunsdale Murders, which is kind of a, mi- a cross between the Bill and Midsummer Murders. Um, that I've definitely never seen a lot of day. Um, but then in terms of a book, the first one I wrote was um, a story called Death of a, Death of a Kindred, which was for my friend's 60th birthday. That's really interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that your first, first attempt was a screenplay. Yeah. That's absolutely fascinating. So I, th- <laughs> I think I think probably my first uh, writing attempt was actually a screenplay. That's really weird. Well, it wasn't a screenplay. It was a, it was actually a radio drama. So when I was mm. at school, I bought they made available as as a book the complete scripts of the radio version of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So I thought it'd be quite good fun to get a load of mates to um, to do it. And we recorded the twelve episodes. And it was all good fun, and nobody wanted it to stop. So we um, we a friend and I decided to write a ninety minute special. And um, we wrote it, and it was full of terrible, terrible jokes. Some of them may be a bit <laughs> Douglas Adamsy, but um, and then weirdly, when I was at college, I lent it to a friend. Never got it back. I really wish I still had it because it was probably crap. <laughs> but there were some good bits and pieces in there. Oh, that's absolutely fascinating. Oh, so so you would never show that to anyone? No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, there was nothing unequivocal about that, was there? That was yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah, not. Never got to do <laughs> so you've got your, your groups of characters, mm-hmm. uh, which means each mystery um, has potentially a different set of characters. So who are your core characters? Who are the ones that, I would say outside Miss Trent's, who are likely, jar, barring accidents, to yeah. appear in most of the books? So there's yeah, so the core characters who have the skills that generally are needed in most books. So you have Mr. Sam Snyder, who is their driver, but also he, because he is a veteran cab, has cab driver, he has a very detailed knowledge of the streets and the transport networks and the railways, the omnibuses, the trams, because there's still trams at this point in London, as if you need to know where to get how to get somewhere, then he's mad to ask. You also have uh, Miss Georgina Dexter, who is an artist. She also has a bit of an interest in photography, but she's really useful because if somebody's seen um, somebody you know, see a crime, she could sit down and actually take the description and do a sketch from that witness. So she's always um, tends to be in the mysteries. And um, Mr. Joseph Maxwell, who is a was an apprentice journalist, now a full journalist and a gaslight gazette. He tends to be it because being a journalist, he is quite good at ask, asking questions and he can look back in the archives of the newspaper to see if there's any sort of bearing on past cases as well. But they tend to be the main core characters that tend at the moment, who tend to be in every um case other than Miss Trent. Now you've written you've published four books. You've yeah. written a fifth, which is, for those of you who want to know all about it, the title is being exclusively revealed on the Bow Street Society podcast, which yeah. is available for download in 23 minutes time. Um, it's a really good title. Um, again, I, I can't give away what it is, but um, as I think I've said to you before, it's Normally, a title gives you an idea of what's happening in the story, but this particular one will make somebody who's read the rest of the books go, oh, my. Was that deliberate or? Yes. It was always <laughs> going to yeah. <laughs> it was always gonna be that title. Because um, the actual mystery itself sort of took di- different sort of variations in my mind leading up to this. Because basically... The, I can say this without sort of giving away too much. The, this mystery is a combination of things that happened in the first four books. So as I was going through those first four books, I had various sort of um, scenarios in my mind what that book would actually look like. Um, but it was always going to be that title. Excellent. Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be one of your beta readers. So I started 
uh, reading it late last night. So I've only read sort of the first, not even all of the prologue yet, because I'm taking my time and reading it through thoroughly. Um, so what's your process when you when you write something? Obviously, you have the idea. How do you actually go about doing the writing? So obviously with a series, you've got sort of the foundations they'll read with the characters. But what I tend to do is when I'm, it will start the mystery. So I will tend to start with the victim in the mystery because the victim is actually the one at the centre of everything. Um, then you sort of, I normally start with that sense. I sort of start with the method of murder. So I think, well, what, have, what haven't I done yet? So um, sort of look at what I've done previously and then decide um, what I want to do next and then um, build up that victim around that method of murder because obviously normally it links to do with their occupation or their um, domestic circumstances. And then you decide who the murderer is Link to that person, and then you go out from there around the suspects. Generally, rule of thumb is that there's six suspects. Um, the smaller the group of suspects, the more detail you have to go into in their background and more investigation. So it depends really how deep you want to go into, and then from there you then um, sort of build up the plot and the mystery based loosely upon those elements. And then because mine is set in 1896, and then need to do research to see what is this actually viable in that era um and see and then once you do that you then find out well could they actually investigate this type of murder at that time did they have technology to be able to detect if it was a poison could they detect that how would they detect that and then from there i then decide well which members would then investigate and then how would those members use their skills to solve the crime because if they can't use their skills to solve the crime then it's a bit pointless than being there so it needs to be able to sort of link into all of that and then once that's generally sort of just done on Word documents, sort of writing notes, just sort of free flow thoughts, really. So while I'm writing that, I'll just literally ask a question while I'm typing that up just to help me sort of get through those sort of like different sort of elements and sort of decide to form the plot itself. And then I will then go on to, I've got um, Writers Cafe Storyline program. It's a virtual like online like PCM program. It's got a virtual notes board on there. So then I always have sort of the core plot lines that run throughout the series. So each line on the notice board is a different plot line. So I'll have like the mystery at the top, then you've got like the romance, and you've got conspiracy, and you've got other elements, which I'm not going to say because they're, they're coming in the new book. Um, and then each line has a card on each, each column, which is a card represents an event. So I plan the whole mystery with, in the card format, and it generates a report. And then once I've done that, is then more research again to make sure that what I've done would be um, able to do back in back in that era, and then I then finally go into the actual writing of it. And uh, how how long how long did it take? Pardon me. How long did it take you to write the the one you've just finished? I think you only finished it a week ago or so. Yeah, um, well, I planned it back in fully back in twenty nineteen. I obviously wanted to start writing it in 2020, but because of certain things that happened in it, I wanted to do research down at the Metropolitan Police Historic Service um, collection. Um, but they were moving, so I couldn't go down there for that reason. But then also the pandemic happened, so I then couldn't go again to um, do that research. And eventually I had to sort of just rely on the reason that I already had, um, because they're, they're, doing, they're still just um, posted the moving still at the moment. Um, so basically, in terms of writing it, I think it was about um, six, seven months, I think, roughly. Because I've already done the planning. Once you've done the planning, the actual writing of it is, is easier because you just follow the plot plan. Although sometimes, you know, I mean, this one I had to basically keep sort of rejigging the plot plan around because things would make more sense in different orders. Um, and also depending on what characters say and do, you've then got to sort of reorganise as well. I was going to specifically ask that about characters not doing the things you quite want them to do and the impact it has on the narrative. Um, I remember you telling me that this happened in book one, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, with um, Mr. Jenna Dexter and Mr. Joseph Maxwell, they were meant to just be associates and um, they got in a carriage together and she touched his hand and he was like, oh. And I was like, oh, okay, so it's going to be a romance now. So that's how that literally started out, basically. I don't intend to sort of... I don't intend to sort of make an effort to include romance. Romance is not really sort of my thing. But um, that in that situation, it was, yeah, it was obviously those two characters liked each other and therefore there was nothing I could do about it, basically. You've got a really good mixture of characters. So as well as the Bow Street Society characters, you've got at least four 
mm. important characters from the police force. Probably more if you start, in, you know, incorporating some of the sergeants and constables and stuff. But you've got four key mm. police characters. Um, who's your favourite character at the moment that you write for? Our favourite character at the moment that I write for is probably Detective Inspector John Conway, purely because he is such a a multi-layered character. He, in one hand, he embodies that whole ethos of being a, a policeman, you know, um, being a policeman in your life. It's it literally everything that he is is connected to being a policeman. But at the same time, he's also supporting the British society, which is basically working in effect against the police. So he's my most favourite character is Michael because of that, but also he's also the most difficult character in Michael because sometimes he's not very forthcoming in terms of telling me his thoughts. So it's, you have to sort of really get into sort of his mindset and actually just you really sort of analyse why he's doing what he's doing because it's not always obvious. One, one of the strengths of your books is the amount of description. Uh, that you put into it and obviously this is necessary because in a book mm. set in the modern day people will know what things look like and you don't really need that level of description whereas in yours um, you absolutely do I don't know what a 1896 house or parlour looks like I, I kind of possibly have a rough idea in my head but I don't mm. know and I think one of one of my favourite descriptions um, in all of the books so far and it was so simple I think it was in book three uh, was just the description of Conway's house because yeah. it unconsciously told you so much about him, his relationship with his job. Um, how much research did you have to do to make to make that that relatively small sequence work? Um, well, what I what I always do when I, when I decide decide and where I'm going to place a character and where they live, I always first of all look on Boob's property map to see where so that class of person would live because it's colour coded. In terms of, they actually literally went round, um, the councils literally went round at the time and was in the interview with people who lived in the houses. And that's how they determined what social class they were. And so, obviously, you look at geographically, like where his work would be, what, uh, like practically, how would he get there? Um, and then, once you've done that, then I go on to, um, so I've identified the street and then I then go on to uh, the London um, Picture Archive, which has some brilliant pictures of streets back, like in just turn of the century if not earlier. So I then look at the houses and then all oh, that, would that be kind of house that he would live in? Yeah, okay, we'll do that. And then um, from there, I would then, well, in his particular case, um, I had to decide, would he have an open fire with a grate or would he have a stove? Um, because basically with a stove, sort of, sort of, sort of, the full sort of, um, you know, you see those old fashioned like cast iron sort of stoves with the, um, with the doors and everything that's very difficult to sort of keep going. So would he have the time to do that? And it took me so long to actually decide. Because technically he could afford a stove, but actually, practically, because he's always out, would he even have a need for one? He's not married. He lives on his own. Um, his house is literally just somewhere that he sleeps. It's just somewhere that he keeps his stuff there as much as it is. Um, but I had a book. I've got one book that is just about stoves and crates. And so I used that to determine what kind of setup he would for his cooking. But um, it's funny because some of my... Um, people have read the books I've said that particular description we initially go in his house is quite depressing because you know pile is dark it's obviously not been used he's you know he's there on his own and it's obviously quite did like I say did say a lot about his character but also what I enjoyed with that book is that then later on Miss Trent and um his Conway's um, senior officer then go to his house and he's very much like all oh, but tied the up and he's you know he's made the effort to make it look all nice and everything it's the same time even though it is just something he's seeks is he has guests that he's quite proud of it as well i mean i the first thing i i thought when i was first introduced to the first book i sat there reading oh, i've got an inspector called conway why does that ring a bell um and uh, yeah so i i i as as i think anybody who reads books does you kind of take more from it maybe than the author intended so i have to say i i am obsessed with the fact that john conway is somehow related to derek conway who was um chief inspector at sunhill police station yeah. until he died in 2002 um obviously that's a, that's a complete coincidence that wasn't something you, you did on purpose um, it was yeah. It was, but I, I, I love it. I, I still, I'm still, you know, I'm reading the books, hoping that one day he'll, um, he'll have a kid or something, just because, because now I know, <laughs> such a shame. 
The only way he could ever have a kid is if he had some kind of liaison like years ago, which he then didn't know there was a child involved. Because I think he's the kind of person that if he knew that he'd got a woman pregnant, he would marry her. Right. He wouldn't let her be like, you know, even in basically. He would have made sure that she was made an honest woman of and looked after. So it'd only be if she didn't tell him. Cool. Who's your favourite... Who's your favourite character out of the actual um, out of the actual society? Um, I think that's probably um, Mr. Percy Locke, the illusionist, because he is so arrogant yet at the same time so vulnerable. Because he makes out that he, you know, he is a gentleman, so he's quite wealthy. He's the owner of the Palace of Palladium. He has what he performs, and so he's quite well off. But at the same time, he has a lot of demons, and he's actually um, addicted to heroin. So he's got a lot of things he has to deal with. Um, but the fact as well that he's also a gentleman thief and he's got knowledge about knocks and, um, you know, so he's quite useful when they need to search a place without somebody knowing. But, um, but yeah, I think, again, he's quite a complex character and I, quite, I do quite enjoy... And also he's one of those characters that you can quite enjoy doing, like, um, when somebody's not being very nice in the book, you can they, they can they can make quite a witty remark and that's quite funny sometimes as well. I, I really like him. Um, I'm going to tell you who my favourite is. I've already had this conversation, so you already know. But it is the absolutely disgusting. He's also a Percy, actually. Um, <laughs> Percy Weeks, the Canadian Percy, pathologist. Percy, 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 Percy. Sorry? Never, don't ever call Dr. Percy Weeks Percival. That's no. Okay. He's Percy. <laughs> he's Percy. However, the character is an absolute delight i mean he's completely disgusting um he's got he the way he talks to people shows absolutely no consideration the um the things he does now we had a discussion about this before and you said you think that's more of a product of his time than than being a quirk yeah. of his but like one of one of my the bits that amused me and disgusted me the most was there was a bit where he's at a pub and he's sort of oh, wiping blood off his hands because he hadn't got around to cleaning up he gives, he gives the money to the barmaid and uh, he's got blood in his hands he's like i'm a doctor and she's like oh <laughs> it doesn't make it better, you know. But uh, also, the thing, the fact that he, which always discussed the character in the book, is that whenever he talks, refers to a body, he doesn't refer to the body; he refers to it as meat. Which everybody's like, "What do you mean, meat?" <laughs> yes, yes, I've, I had, I had picked up on that. Um, but he's there's there's a definite. Well, there is a bit more of a history hinted at. Uh, I won't say much, too much, because I don't want to spoil things. But something unexpected. Well, not an unexpected character turns up in the third book. Which mm. is the case of the spectral, spectral shot. shot. I remembered. I remembered. Yeah. I'm terrible with the names. I in my head they're books one to four, which is quite a good thing because I don't want to accidentally name book five. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, I I do love Doctor Weeks, um, and I I just I really like the series because as I've said to you on many occasions, I'm not. It's not a genre that I like. It's not a genre that I usually enjoy. Um, and for me, the reason I enjoy yours is it's the characters. They are all unique. They're all interesting. They've all got quirks and they've all got secrets. I mean, one of the things that, that dangled at the end of book four, which I'm hoping, well, I don't know if it will be followed up in book five, but you've got this past associate of Miss Trent's um, that the police now know about. And I was kind of expecting a confrontation in book four and it didn't happen. So there's that plot thread to look forward to in book five. I don't know if it will be picked up, but I'm guessing that character which may appear. Past, which past associate are you talking about? I'm thinking specifically, well, I don't know if she is a past associate, but Polly. It's the barmaid. Yeah. Is it Polly? Polly, yeah. yeah. So she is, technically is a member of a society that doesn't necessarily get called in to cases. But yeah, so she is, as shown in book two, she is a past lover. That, that's in, do you know what because when she said oh i'm a member in book four i thought she was just um deliberately I, i'd forgotten she was a member i thought that she was deliberately um feeding lee a line there just to put well, that's in interesting two, um dr weeks is questioning one of the witnesses and then polly walks in and miss trench trying to stop her because obviously polly is currently involved with dr weeks yes but this barmaid's got nothing to do but whatsoever. <laughs> and he's a junk. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so um, obviously, basically, um, I think Ms. Chen was hoping that there could be Kim something with Polly, but basically Polly said that she'd fallen in love with Dr. Weeks. So at the moment, it, that is not going anywhere. 
I mean, how how big a deal would it have been in Victoria if 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 the police uncover that they were in a relationship and decide to spread it around? Maybe let the local newspaper, well, the the, the Gaslight Gazette. Well, it was illegal, know. first of all, to get arrested. It was illegal. Was it illegal for women? I, I my understanding was that it was only illegal for men. I, I and this is probably something I've heard completely wrong. What I've read is mostly um, um, men that had the cases against. But I think probably women was more sneaky. I think because I because I thought. I'd, I'd read that Queen Victoria didn't believe that lesbians existed, therefore they weren't covered by any law. But that could be something I've read that's completely wrong. But to be honest, it's one of those things that unless they literally caught them in the act, it would be difficult to prove. True. So it's, you know, it would literally be sort of, you know, or they had like a love letter or something, something physical that actually, um, I think, I haven't read that much into it, but what I've read, it tends to be uh, people who've been caught literally in the act of doing it that's been arrested. Right. I mean, it, it, it's it's very interesting because, again, you've got a few, you've got a, quite a few characters with, with different sexualities, which is quite interesting. So you've got um, Elliot, the, uh, the the solicitor, mm-hmm. uh, who's who's not, I wouldn't say openly gay, but um, then you've also got Inspector... Mr. Elliot is of a pretty, pretty precious his sexuality. Yeah. And then you've got Inspector Lee. You see, that's a very interesting dynamic there because I'm you've set that up for something to happen in the future. And I don't necessarily mean something between them, mm. but I'm half expecting Inspector Lee to be in a position to hold it against Elliot and maybe force Elliot to do something that maybe betrays the society. I don't know. There, there's definitely... I'm interested to see where Lee, that plays out. Um, I think that was Lee's intention. But again, the problem with that situation is... which. Um, He's all, he also affects his sexuality, so it's difficult for them two to even do anything because they're both like, unless you actually ask each other, or you know, are you do you like men? It's obviously because Lee being an inspector, it's a big no no as well. But um, so because there was originally going to be a um, between them two, was going to be a bit of a liaison between them two, but then obviously the way I wrote the characters, it, w- it wouldn't have worked basically because the way they see their own sexuality and the way that they live their lives, it's it wouldn't necessarily work. But yeah, I can see what you mean. Yeah, Lee's got that up his sleeve that he could actually use that against him. Well, there's another five books. So. Yeah. <laughs> How far ahead do you plan? Obviously, you've just finished um, your your draft of, of book five. You've got beta readers looking at it now. Uh, mm-hmm. It's hopefully coming out in September. Do you know what happens in book six already? For the main plot line that goes through the whole series, I know what happens right up until book nine. Interesting. I've planned that up until book nine, yeah. And so there's a couple of plot lines that link off of that, which again, um, I'm, they're, they're, they're all planned up to book nine. Because I did all that between books four and five, so I knew what would need to happen in book five, because book five is very much a bridge book in, between the two halves of the series. So basically from this point onwards, it's going to bump up in terms of the drama and the intrigue. I, I really like, as, as well as obviously the actual individual mysteries, I really do like the ongoing story. Um, I mean, I, I sat there, so I only read, I think, the first the first scene, the first six pages of, I nearly said the name then, book five. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be revealed in three minutes. In three minutes, guys, um, the podcast is released. The first episode of the podcast, at some point during which Tani reveals the name of the fifth book. Well, as, as we're three minutes away from that, um, tell me a little bit about, about the podcast and why we're doing it. Because it is, it is, it is us, isn't it? So I am. It the is us, yeah. As I say, we were prepared to mention that earlier on. That Richard is my lovely co-host. He's been a massive help doing the podcast. He's obviously done podcasts in the past, and that's been. I've always wanted to do a podcast, but I didn't want to do a podcast on my own because I think having two hosts on podcasts works out better. And Richard's just so good at sort of being a presenter and sort of you know that sort of very charismatic that it just really, I think, lifts the podcast rather than just me being on my own. So thank you very much for all your help. It's thank been you. amazing. Um, but yeah, so, in the, so it's very much a magazine format. It has got obviously explores the history of Bow Street, explores the history of police. And so in the first episode, we do have um, an interview with the ladies of the mu- new museum in Bow Street, the Bow Street Police Museum. We also have a segment um, which we recorded to do with the history of Bow Street itself, which is very interesting. Um, we have a interview with Miss Trent. So that that's my favourite segment of the podcast actually giving the readers and listeners a chance to actually put their questions directly to the characters from the series. So rather than me just sitting there saying, oh, it, you know, it's Miss Trent, this is her name, so she's born, 
you actually have that direct connection um, with the books. Um, so if you have a favourite character who you are dying to ask a particular question of, then you can actually ask them and hear them reply. And um, we have voice actors, Sabrina Paul, Phil Rowe and Jaden Brannu voicing those characters. And we also um, place the interviews in their natural environment. So if Miss Trent, it will be in the British Society parlour. Um, and basically, yeah, so the podcast will be every other month, so it'll obviously be this month, then it'll be um, September for the next one. Um, they're about like 50 minutes long, aren't they? But yeah. even though it has got all that sort of that history, we have goals a bit sort of a bit tongue in cheek as well. So they're quite a bit of humour in as well. And I know that um Richard like loves one of the, the things that Phil sent us, which is absolutely hilarious. Yeah. yeah, well just to break up the um each segment because at one point we didn't know if we were going to have to carry adverts and stuff so i wanted mm. to have a way of breaking up each um each each bit so that if, if an advert had to go in there'd be a way of telling you you were back into the podcast um yeah and luckily we found a way of doing it without advertising i think i'm guessing if you listen to it on spotify and you're not a subscriber it probably will insert adverts because i can't imagine there'd be 50 minutes anyway um mm. let me just have a look at what the time is because we're kind of relying on this happening so <laughs> what's the, right so in 10 seconds time the podcast will be live uh, and five <laughs> Four, three, two, one. Do you think it works? <laughs> I shall now. I shall now find uh, out. Um, if not, I can release it manually. But what I'm going to do is go to iTunes and go to the podcast library and go to the individual shows. Bow Street Society podcast. Refresh. Refresh. <laughs> right. I'm going to release it manually. Hang on. <laughs> Let me just go into Anchor and see if it, it may have done. It may just take iTunes a moment to. Uh, oh, no, 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 it's there. Uh, according to, yep, yeah, excellent stuff. So, yeah, according, so, so it is out. It's just been released on, um, on Anchor, which means it should very soon be available on all the other. Um, Listen. Yes, now. Please, please do listen. <laughs> well, hey. Wait till you finish talking, then go and listen to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not quite sure how I update. Hang on. Episode one trailer. Well, it, it, it will be on iTunes soon. It's definitely been released. I've just checked on. The next five minutes, isn't it? By the time to give it a chance to actually sort of activate. Yeah. Let me just have a look on Spotify as well. See if it's, uh, see what Spotify is doing, which is actually owned by Anchor. So it's much more likely to be. Um, on there, it was yeah. there first, wasn't it? Before it was there pretty quickly when we did the trailer. It says see all episodes, and it's still only got the one. Oh well, it'll be. It it has been released by Anchor, so it should it should start turning up soon. Well, that was that was fun. <laughs> I'll I'll keep I'll keep an eye on it. Um, no, so the the podcast was was good fun to do. We're um we're quite far ahead, aren't we? So yes. um over half of show two is recorded, and we've got interviews beyond that as well. Um, Doctor Weeks, which I think you're probably look, very looking forward to. I am looking forward to the Doctor Weeks interview. Yeah, I'm looking forward to. There's there's loads of things in it. Um, one of the things you 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 didn't do when you mentioned the museum was hold up your mug again. Oh yeah, sorry, I do that. Yeah, museum cup. Oh. I actually go. got this up before they even started selling them because I voted them and I included a mug may on my social media. Oh so, yes, explain that because you you one referred of the first to... mugs they sold. That's cool. Yeah. So the museum looks very, very interesting. The um, the uh, what do you call it? The the we, when we interview them, um, one of the actual people is where when we interviewed them in the one of the police cells. Yeah. So we actually <laughs> one of the people we interviewed was actually one of the actual cells that um, that uh, yeah. So that was absolutely fascinating. I'm just I keep checking my. The museum is housed in the building which used with the original building that housed the magistrates court and the police station so in the books where inspector wolf is based he's based in e divisions station in bow street yeah. so if you were going to bow street now you could actually see the building where as peter's in the books because the building itself is now a hotel but the museum is found inside in what was the um, police custody cells that's that is incredible i mean I, i'm really looking forward to at some point going to see it they also do 
walking tours as i think we said in the podcast there's a there's a tour called of mollies and men which was um i think deliberately launched in pride month but it was all about the yeah. the link between um the lgbt community of the time obviously they weren't called that then yeah because i'm really interested to actually go on that obviously mm. based because some characters that are like um lgbtq i think it would be good to actually go on that more just to get a bit more background information yeah, you I mean, know, I, I find out everything because always, you know, you keep getting as much information you can for, you know, with these sort of things. And the good news is that particular walk has been extended. So the, the sad thing was we thought it was over and done with when we recorded the interview. But since then, they and we, we do mention this in the podcast, they have yeah. launched more walking tour dates for, I think, up to and including November. But go mm. to their website, Bow Street Police Museum dot org dot UK. Um, mm. and uh, they've they've put a lot of work and a lot of time and they've got some very interesting stuff there. So I'd say that's the the interview with them is the backbone of the show. Um, for some reason, it hasn't yet turned up on some of the other apps. It's definitely out there. The actual, if you go to anchor.fm and look for the Bow Street Society podcast, which is who hosts it for us, um, episode one has been released. So three minutes ago, according to this. So at some point today, I'll keep looking out on the other bits and pieces. Um, but at some point today, we will actually have, um, it will be out there. Because if you send me the links for those different platforms, I will put those links on my website, on the page, so people can then click on those links and then go straight to the podcast cool. on the website, which would be good. Excellent stuff. Okay. Um, is there anything else you think I should ask you <laughs> before we kind of wrap wrap this up? Well, no, you want to ask me some questions, don't you? Before ask you questions, yeah, yeah. Okay. So. All right. Is there anything else you think I should ask you before before you grill me? <laughs> I mean, I'll be in comfort, I think. But, but are you sitting comfortably? Okay, no, that's not it. at all. <laughs> so obviously, as you say, I will be intending to put this on my YouTube channel. So just for those people who will watch this on my YouTube channel of Mike Nobs or um, come across your work for, can you please just start by introducing yourself and also telling us what project you're currently working on? Okay, um, my name is Richard Boxhall. Um... I'm an unpublished author. I haven't published anything at all, really, yet. Um, yeah. The current project I'm working on has had many titles. It started off as The Artist and is currently called Still Life, which I think is a really good title for it, but it isn't a very original <laughs> book title. There's already been a book published in the last year by, oh, that Scottish author. I can't remember her name, but uh, there's already been a book called Still Live Published. So whether that will be the final title or not, I don't know. Um, my stuff starts in the real world and then gets a bit uh, a bit odd. So the basic premise of the story, it's about an immortal artist um, who kidnaps women and traps them. Well, not just women, but mainly women and traps them in his artwork. So they effectively disappear off the face of the earth. Um, and it's the story about how after nearly 2000 years of doing this, um, he gets caught. So that's basically what it's about. You've also got another book that you're just, uh, mapping up at the moment, haven't you as well, that you've been doing on your stream? Uh, yes. So the, um, the, the, the one that I'm, I've nearly finished, I think it is finished. I'm giving it one final read through to make sure is called the English Hikikomori and, I wrote this before anything happened in terms of a, of a pandemic, but it's all about somebody who isolates himself <laughs> <laughs> um, because of mental health problems. Um, and it's, it's, it's not a happy story. Um, yeah. And it's all about someone. It's basically about someone working up to suicide. So it's incredibly cheerful. It, it's, it's more multi-layered than that because I have actually read the book and it is really, really good. I'm very impressed by the book. And I think you have a fantastic author. Not that you always think that yourself but I do think you are okay. um, and it, there's much more to it than that and I think once I've you know it's one of those books that stay with you long after you finish reading it and then the characters and especially the character of Freddie is really well drawn and so even though say what his situation is going through is very multi-layered and you definitely go on that journey with him and it's definitely when when it, did, when, when it gets released I'll definitely recommend people to go and buy it because it's a fantastic read Oh, thank you very much. As I say, I, I think it's a, I think it has a, a, a very, I think it'll have a niche audience if it was ever released because um, I've sent it to quite a few people and, and my general thoughts are 
blokes find it too much. So every single male reader has either not liked it or not finished it because it was too too depressing and it is it is yeah. quite heavy in places it really is i was getting a lot of stuff out of the system when i wrote it <laughs> if you remember you will be sort of obviously releasing to a global audience so there will be people out there who will um really connect. i think the people who will really connect with the character of freddie and really sort of take to him and um really become involved with the story because then um, you definitely get the impression that it's written for somebody who's been there it's not somebody who's just trying to write about depression based upon what they've read on like websites and in books no that's fair <laughs> yeah so but that, that makes such a difference though when you if you are somebody who has had depression and has been that yourself it's something it's difficult to be able to read from a point of view somebody who's been in that similar situation because then you feel like that connection and then you feel like vindicated to a certain, to a certain degree i think um because it, oh i'm not the only one no and through fiction, I think you definitely will help a lot of people with that book when when you release it. I mean, I think for me, it was it was definitely, I didn't really write it to show to other people. I wrote it to get a lot of stuff out of my system. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not the character in the book or anything like that. And I was yeah. never and I was never suicidal, but I was very, very unwell at a certain point and And yeah, um, and really that that was just a way of getting a lot of the negativity in my head onto mm. paper and help me kind of rationalize it and understand it and it was a, as i said really really cathartic process because you read it and you think my god what kind of nutcase thinks that oh that's right i thought that <laughs> <laughs> so there was definitely an element of therapy in getting it out but then like you say it isn't terrible it's there are i think there are some um there are some positive points in it and hopefully at some point some other people you know, other than close friends and family, we'll get an opportunity to read it. We'll see. Um, I am this close to finishing it, though. I'm literally giving it one final read through just to make sure there's nothing I want to change, which I don't think there will be. And then mm. I'm going to literally close the close the cover on it. And that'll be yeah. that. Yeah, so you also mentioned earlier on that you've done um, some sort of writing, the screening, like a pod, was it a podcast, like, oh, well, like this hits one guy for the script for you and your friends. Yeah. Obviously, you said you just explained why you did... Um, no I should have done it a long long time ago so I've always enjoyed it I always got wonderful feedback from teachers at school about stuff that I wrote and um uh and unfortunately when your brain and mind is in a certain place it kind of dries up creatively and I I was a um, a manager at a well-known retail outlet um, that sells a lot of value things. Anyway, I was I was a manager for them. That was my job, and it was the reason. It was absolutely that the culture of the of the company at the time was absolutely the reason behind my depression. And what I found was I could I had no creative ability when I was depressed. It kind of almost it's like it's erased from you, and it took a long time to come back. So I left that job in two thousand and fourteen. I started writing songs again in about 2016, which was a sign to me that it was going the right way. And I'd had this idea for the English Hikikomori and really wanted to do something with it, but mm. never really got round to it. And then I listened to podcasts about writing and stuff like that um, and was aware of NaNoWriMo. And I've been aware of it for like 10 plus years, you know, I've been because that's. There's a, 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 a writer called Mer Lafferty, who I think is published now. But when she started, she was literally an unpublished author hoping to get published. Um, and the podcast was called I Should Be Writing. And it was all about her writing and what she did and the processes she went through and interviewing with. Because she was quite a good podcaster. She managed to get published authors on. Um, and she used NaNoWriMo as a way of starting. So, so I kind of decided in November 2018 to actually take part in NaNoWriMo mm. um, and one of the things I hadn't really realised was the existence of the local groups yeah. so I started halfway through I didn't even start on the 1st of November I kind of thought about it halfway through the month and thought well it's not over yet I won't do the 50,000 words but I'll give it a go so <coughs> <coughs> excuse me yeah I went along to the uh, one of the, my local writing groups and and found the atmosphere quite quite conducive and encouraging obviously that's that's how i know you yeah um and 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 a few other people um 
Yeah, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I still remember, I still remember you come to that first meeting because it was me, you and Jeff, I think, were there. And we were te- me and Jeff were telling you about our sort of writing projects. And I remember you sort of, sort of wanted to know more, more about that really rather than sort of what you were sort of working at the time. Yeah. But, um, but yes, it was more, the question was sort of, yeah, but how did you, you know, why did you continue writing and how did you get into yeah, writing? Yeah, so, so I've, as I said, I've always wanted to and I should have done it a long time ago. And, um, you know, I'm, I I enjoy it. I find it in places cathartic. I enjoy I enjoy thinking up stories. And, and one of my favourite bits in the writing process is where something unexpected happens. Yeah. And... Uh, one of the, the the projects one I haven't mentioned because it's a little bit big and I haven't finished yet. It's called Empress of the Trees, and it's another really cheerful story because I do cheerful um, about the end of the world, um, and it's uh, it's an it's an ecological story about um, well, it's based on oh, I won't go into too much detail, but basically trees talk to each other and they discover that as an absolute fact. It happens. Mm-hmm. It's done through a fungal network called mycelia. They like join the roots together and they can communicate with each other. That's a fact. That's true. I heard it on Radio Four, so it must be. And, um, <laughs> and I, I thought, well, what, what if they really are a lot smarter than we give them credit for? And what if they don't like what we're doing to the atmosphere of the planet? And what if there was something they could do about it? And that was kind of the basis of the story. And um, what did you ask me again? See, I'm, 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 I'm good thing this is a job <laughs> interview, isn't it? Well, you mean you're doing pretty well, but. Um... I mean, Ducky, a bit before, obviously, your books are set in sort of the real world, and um, I think we're definitely the Empress of the Trees, you can sort of argue that it's sort of almost bordered onto that sort of urban fantasy. Absolutely, yes, yeah. But, but what I would say is very much they are grounded still in reality, in the sense of you haven't got like people with laser beams and super, super powers sort of running around. It's not that kind of fantasy, right. it's okay. more like. I just need um, to write a note, remove laser beams from chapter seven. <laughs> <laughs> It's same reality, but it's got a fantastical sort of um, yes. scenario that everybody has to deal with. Um, and I think you're very good at sort of drawing the characters and bringing out humanity in the characters. And I think that that sort of more of extreme situation is very good at sort of bringing that out. It, it's absolutely the characters that make it work for me. As I said, oh, that's what we were talking about. Things. Mm. That, so there, there was, there was. It's happened that in. in all of my books so far, apart from English Eke and Mori, which had a very, very... I knew the structure of that before I started. Mm. But there have been occasions in both of these books where things have happened mm. which weren't in the plan and initially caused me a headache. But what I've found on both occasions is my way out of that headache has actually created a better story. Mm. Um, there's... Uh, in, in Still Life, you've got... It's basically about uh, the, the two main characters at the beginning are at the end of a failing relationship. Um, And that was part of the story. They had to kind of not be together when something happens later in the book. And then the the rotters got (laughs) back together. It's like, no, you can't do that. You're not supposed to like each other. What what are you doing? And it created me a massive headache. So I had to think of another reason for them to not be together. And... It's my favourite, I can't say what it is, I think I've told you, it's my favourite bit in the book, because I'm hoping when somebody reads it, they'll read that bit and go, mm. oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I love stuff like that. Something similar happened in Empress of the Trees. Again, I had, um, again, it was it was two characters that were not even meant to be, or well, they're not an item, but there's an attraction which wasn't meant to be there, which then created a subplot which has turned out to be my favourite subplot in the book again. So when yeah. you write your when you do your writing, are you aware that it's going to be read? Are you aware of the readers or are you just so engrossed by the characters in the world that you just let yourself get carried away by it? That one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So you're that not thinking I'll put this bit in because that will shock the reader. Are you just you're thinking no. I'll just let the characters um, I, I like that any good book, I mean, obviously I don't have to tell you this, but any good book has twists and turns, has things happening in it which are unexpected. That's that's just the skill of writing. Um, so, no, I don't think I, I put them in there because I think it would surprise me if I was reading it. I suppose that's the closest I would get to empathising with what a reader might be going through. Um, I mean, like with the English Hikikomori, um, 
it, this, if you actually describe, not an awful lot happens in it, realistically. It's ba basically about a person sitting by himself in a room getting more and more miserable. But you have to empathise with... It's more to it than that, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry? It's more to it than that, but yeah, I'm not going to give it away. That, that, that's the bottom line, what it is. And, and it, it works, if it works, it works for one reason. You care about what happens to that character. <clears throat> if, if you don't then the whole thing's a complete waste of time. And I think I think that's true for a lot of books. I think that's true for everything I've written since. You know, as much as the situations are fantastical and not realistic, um, I'm more interested in my characters and how the situations impact on them. You know, my main character in Empress of the Trees is an 18-year-old girl who discovers that her parents are not her parents and actually she was created for a very very specific purpose but you don't know that mm. at the beginning of the book she's happy at home she's you know it's her 18th birthday um she knows she's adopted because her dad doesn't lock the drawers in his office and so her parents are working up to telling her love we should have told you this years ago um but you know, actually, we're not your real parents. And they make, yeah. they work themselves up into this absolute lather about telling them. She's going, oh, yeah, I know, Dad, Dad left his dad left his drawing locked. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, like, uh, and, and so she, she's a very, I think she's a very well-rounded character. We shall see. Um, I, 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 Freddie was easy to write for because he was kind of, in a way, he was me. Whereas my lead characters in the other two books are both female, and I'm not quite sure... I hope I've got it right. I hope I've got... This is why I'm so interested in your feedback of still life when I've finished the second draft, is I, I don't know... In fact, nearly all the characters in still life ended up being female, which wasn't a decision. It's not, it's not mm. something I deliberately did. It just kind of... It's just how it played out. I think there are three or four characters in it that are male, and two of them are like bit parts. So... <laughs> but, so um, when you have an idea for a book, what is then your process turning that idea into a, a manuscript oh dear um that's uh so with english ikikomori i i literally wrote down um uh, uh, I'd, I'd i'd written down the, the broad structure before i even I, I knew i'd been thinking about it for years so yes. um when it came to empress of the trees i knew roughly what i wanted to happen at the beginning I knew what I needed to happen at the end, but I deliberately left the middle bit kind of grey so it could evolve on on its own. And what I tend to do is most of my books are in sort of almost episodes. So yeah. um, Hikikomori is in kind of two episodes, really. Although mm. originally I wrote it in four, but that made no sense at all. And I came <laughs> with really pretentious titles for each, each episode, but they went in the editing process. Um, and then... I will usually, the, the, the quarter I'm writing, I will have a chapter breakdown, which is very, very detailed. It's basically scene for scene what needs to happen. Yeah. Um, and then I have notes for the later bits of the story, um, which get filled out the closer I get to them. So I'm usually about a quarter of a book ahead in terms of detailed plan. But then they always change. My biggest problem with Empress of the Trees was my, my final quarter was terrible it kind of was building up to building up to this event and then I didn't really know how to end it and I have figured that out now which is one of the reasons why hopefully this month I'm going to do a bit a bit more work on that um it had characters going back and forth for no good reason I suddenly thought well hang on this is where the climax is set and I've got them going there why haven't go back to somewhere else and then come back yeah and just have bring the bring the timeline forward and just make things happen where they are um so yeah so i work in i, I don't have I, I don't do what you do because because you have a very specific you you know who your murderer is <laughs> and why they did it and all that yeah. at the beginning although is it true there is a crime writer out there who doesn't know when he writes is that true possibly there, there's a lot of, there's some crime writers who are called or what they call pantsers they'll just write as you know make not make make up but they all sort of plan as they go along rather than actually doing the full detail plot plan i couldn't do that i don't see how anybody writing your genre of book actually could it just makes no sense to me but um yeah. not editing afterwards but yeah it's because you've got to make sure you put the clues in you've got to lead your um reader from the point of the murder around the garden different garden paths and then back down to the end gate where the solution is so it's very well, that's quite difficult to do. But um, anyway, getting back to your books. <laughs> so with your characters, are your characters I would say that Freddie's basically you, but is there any other characters who you would say based on other people or do you think 
that there's all people that you've based upon characters you've seen TV shows or? Uh, oh, that's a really good question. I hadn't given that thought. What, what I do tend to do is um, uh, I have, I, I in my head it's a movie and I cast yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, oh, do you do that? Yes. You do? Oh, yeah. who plays, who plays Dr. Weeks? <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. Um, well, so, for... so um, yeah, but, yeah, but so Jerome, for me, Jerome Flynn plays Conway. Is that the one that was in Game of Thrones or was that the other one? That was, that was Game of Thrones, yeah. Oh, no, that's fine. If it was the other one, I would have probably probably brought up my breakfast that I didn't have but um yeah no yeah, um, oh no yeah. good, good choice oh I can see that actually um so in um uh, Embers of the Trees I've got this kind of uh I can't remember the actor's name so no point bringing that up but I've got um this old uh Scottish guy who is um he's basically a character who is he was created by the trees to fulfill mm. a specific function um but because he's lived a very long time, these these people, these these creations of the trees can live but three or four times longer than a normal yeah. human being. Um, and he got married and fell in love. And um, when his wife died, part of the things the trees do is 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 kind of level out your emotions and take that away from you. <coughs> and he kind of consciously decided, no, I'm not doing that. I don't want to lose my memories of her. I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to have that smoothed out. I want it to be raw. I want to remember that I loved her. I want to remember how much it hurt mm. when yeah. she died. Um, yeah. The problem is that he ends up as a bit of a drunk and and has and is totally incapable of doing what he's meant to do. And one of the things he's meant to do is mentor a future ambassador, mm. um, and he doesn't. So this poor kid. Um, has an absolutely crappy life. And it's all this guy's fault because he wouldn't do what he was meant to do to smooth out the emotions. And um, and and um, he finally kind of realises he's done a bad thing and submits himself to, to the trees and gets this kind of reset and then literally becomes a different character. He's, he's strong, he's forthright. So in my head, I needed an actor that could play a bit of a drunken idiot but then, <laughs> but then, when it turns round, play someone with absolute authority, who mm. you would respect. So it's obviously Peter Capaldi. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, what I tend to do in my case is if if I'm sort of trying to think of a new character, I might look, do a Google image search and find an image which fits what my how I picture the character in my head. Right. So that's what I did with Doctor Wick. So I did picture that. Would I would say it all fits with. What he looks like, obviously, they're never going to be released. But um, just want to show you something. I'm just showing you my iTunes podcast feed. Ooh. There we go. So, although it didn't come out exactly when we said it would, the podcast is now live on iTunes. Um, let me just check Spotify whilst I'm here. Sorry, I mean, this is a total interruption of what you were saying, but um, that's all right. I can't... We've got some comments as well. I can't have what we've got. There were some comments as well in the chat. Have we? I think so, yeah. Oh, hang on. I've I've come off it to look at that. Oh, this is so rude of me. <laughs> hype, hype, hype. I don't know which bit we were talking about when that was said. Yeah, that's when the podcast was launched. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Yeah, so it is there now. I can see it on Spotify. I can see it on iTunes. It's going to be there on all the others. So yeah. So that's, that's good news. So if somebody's listening to it, they might be quite close to finding out the title of book five. Now, this is, this is away from talking about me. So you're not going to reveal the title in anything you've released until next month. Is that right? Yeah, well, I will um, reveal the cover as well next month. Yes. Excellent. Would you have an idea for the cover image already? So I need to get my artist to get onto that. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Oh no, I'm I'm hoping people enjoy it. I'm hoping we get some reactions. Somebody's already written a review on iTunes, but it was me, so I don't suppose that counts. <laughs> so you said you finished you finished book four, didn't you? Yesterday, I finished book four, and I've started reading book five. Yeah, I really uh, uh, again. It's I enjoyed the mystery, but I enjoyed. The background shenanigans. I enjoyed the the Inspector Lee and Wolf and the Miss Trent bit 
as I say, because it's really the characters in the society that I'm invested in, which is the reason I enjoy reading it. So um, if you did a book that had no mystery in it, but was all about something that um, happened within the society, I'd probably enjoy it. Obviously, that's not the point of what you write and why. But, um, <laughs> you know, I find the characters so interesting and the longer it goes on, you just kind of, you realise there are going to be consequences and things are going to happen. I mean, um, I, I, I don't know, but at some point, I'm guessing um, Chief Inspector Jones, somebody's going to put two and two together about his role and good poker face. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that moment. I'm guessing that'll be around about book nine. I'm just guessing. Um, <laughs> but I think that's going to be an absolutely fascinating just to watch the heads roll and people cover their asses and all that kind of stuff. I think that's going to be really, really interesting. So yeah, I think, I think you'll, I really, I really do like the series. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens next. So in book four, was the merger who you thought it was going to be? Could you figure out? That's always my biggest question. Could you figure out who the merger was? It, 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 I didn't. But what I, what I tend to find is when I read them quickly, mm. I don't pick it up. Whereas with book two, I was giving you feedback on it. So I read each chapter, absorbed it, made notes, and, and I did work out what was going on in book two mm. um, before it was revealed. Not, not to the point where it sport the story for me, because I think that, yeah. as you say, the whole point of a murder mystery is there are clues there. So people can figure it out for themselves. Um, and I did. But um, no, I didn't. The only thing I kind of realised was that it was probably. I almost wondered at one point if somebody was setting setting somebody else up mm. or I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure. So, no, it did. It did come as a bit of a surprise. Um, I, I did. I, again, I don't want to name names. The, the, the person, the, the female involved in it i did wonder if the um kleptomania might be part of it so i kind of figured that out mm. that that perhaps that's how the offending poison got into the the um the oil mm. but i didn't figure out who the other person was um i almost wondered if it was her husband actually <laughs> uh, if they were in it together but uh, no so I, I didn't i didn't work that out Oh, I'm going to have to plug my computer in because my battery's running low, which means we're going to have to move around. Hang on a second. Can you still see me all right? I can see you, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to, hang on. I need to get my cable. I've got a 5% warning, which means, oh. Ah, quick, quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. We're safe. As long as it goes. Um, and what did you think of how the um, Mr. Maxwell bit ended in book four? Um... I really wanted him to not marry her <laughs> um, because it just and, and also there was a bit it, you almost thought oh my god he's grown a pair for a moment you, when, he, when he said oh he interrupts the guy when he's oh yeah well anybody's like speak now or better hold your peace yeah, like, you yeah. Can, you, you're gonna do this and then he doesn't and you just think oh you silly silly sod um <laughs> Because he's kind of sort of got himself into a ridiculous situation now because he's married someone who, oh, what did you describe her as? She looked like a giant snowflake or something in a wedding dress. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's not, I'm assuming that was kind of from his point of view. So it's, yeah, 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 it yeah, was yeah. not the description of someone who was enamoured with his wife um, or wife to be in the next few minutes. Um, so, you know, he's not going to be happy. You know, we also know now that, that Georgina actually really likes him. So she's not going to be happy. Um, and also just because of the way he did things, I thought it was quite sad that the church was half empty. Whereas if he'd be marrying a different person, there would have been a lot more people there. So, yeah, I, 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 th I think because of something you'd said, I knew that was how it was going to play out, that they were going to get married. But I was really, really hoping that that he wouldn't but then as i say knowing what i know about book five the title of which is available on the bow street society podcast which is now <laughs> available to download on itunes google sorry uh, on apple podcasts google podcasts spotify and quite a few others um it is i'm downloading it now um, yeah. <laughs> um you will know the title of the fifth book and the fifth book really ties into some of the things we've been talking about storyline wise and as you say has been building up and building up when they touched hands in book one, mm -hmm. 
did that play into what you were planning for book five or did you was that sort of so book five evolved um really from um i would say was it, was it book three where yeah book three with his conversation with dad right yes dad what a what a lovely man <laughs> oliver yeah yeah, it's he is not 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 the nicest person I've. Uh, <clears throat> but then that's the other thing. You enjoy dislike if a character's well written, you won't mm. just dislike them. You'll actively enjoy disliking them, and mm. and that's definitely the case with with uh, Oliver Maxwell. You don't sit there. You sit there thinking, "What a bastard! What's he going to do? Ne- <laughs> What's he going to do next? <laughs> how 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 is he going to be horrible to his son again?" Okay, well, is there anything else you want to ask me, or should we should we think about wrapping this up? Um, what, what's your next project? I, I don't know is the honest answer. So, still life. Um, I like to do my start my new projects in November and and have that initial mm. writing push through Nano Um That's what I've done for the last three years. However, last year I had no ideas. Literally two weeks before November, I'd kind of decided not to take part. And mm. I don't know where still life came from, but s- somewhere between like me deciding I'm not going to bother, this idea came to me. I don't know how or why. Um, and you actually, I actually did a, I did a live stream about my ideas a couple of days before November started. Yeah. And 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 watching it back now, it's very very woolly compared to what it ended up as. Um, yeah. So I honestly don't know. I have got ideas. So still life is begging a follow on. Um, I've kind of written myself into a bit of a, not into a hole, but there are certain things that people will expect to happen and I don't think they necessarily should. So, for example, I've got a a female character who has magical abilities, but is also very, 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 very angry about the things that have happened. And it would be very, very easy for her to go all willow on us. Yeah. Um, To go all willow from Buffy, um, for people who aren't familiar and and I, I don't really want that to happen because that's too obvious i think mm. there will be some kind of um some kind of there has to be some kind of outpouring of ev- because of everything that's happened but it isn't going to be she's going to go willow rosenberg on us because th- that's been done before um, but i think people will be expecting that because there's um, there's a bit towards the end which but anyway so yes that, that's one possibility sequel follow on from that um i really want to know what happens to freddie and lauren next Mm. um because it's a very one-sided story and you sit there thinking oh freddie's been through the mill hasn't he but as you read it you begin to realize that lauren has as well and i kind of want to tell her story because she whilst helping freddie and all that she was actually in an abusive relationship which freddie is aware of but he's too kind of kind of caught up in his own misery to really do anything about and um she ends up saving his life by f- by fighting back at her abuser um which is probably less of a powerful moment than it should have been because you don't really have the background so mm. i want to explore lauren and her relationship would more. you consider sort of not as you'd be wrong, would you consider doing a version of the first book but from her point of view so the same events but have it from her point of view i did think that um problem is you know what's going to happen so I think yeah, but obviously that you know what happens to Betty, but you don't really necessarily know what's happening to Lauren in between those events. No, but you know how it ends. You know she finally gets away from him. Um, so I I did consider that, but I just didn't think it would work that well. But I did think maybe exploring what happens next, but making it a Lauren centric because there's you read the book. And what do you want to happen at the end? Obviously, apart from what, what, yeah, what, what, what do you want to happen next if you were the reader? What should have been Lauren? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want them to get together. Yeah, I think I mean, eventually I'd want to get together, but I think at the moment they would, they neither them in the right place to be able to no. have a decent relationship. Um. But I would like to yeah, know more about how what happens to her and um, how she goes or how she moves on from that abuse relationship and having to now redefine herself and rediscover herself. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things I have considered doing is following up 
as I say, with a what happened next story. And I've got various titles for it. I was thinking of so so it's set the year before the pandemic, and I kind of because I don't like giving my characters an easy time. Um, Freddie spends a year by himself out of choice, kind of locked up in his home, unable to do anything. How awful, bless him, would it be if when he's finally ready to kind of start going out and start seeing the world again, being told, thanks to a pandemic, you're not allowed to leave your house. <laughs> um, so I, one of the ideas I had in my head was calling it the reluctant Hikikomori because he's now mm. wants to go out and do stuff but can't. Um, yeah. Then that's kind of putting the emphasis too much on him. And I really say it kind of needs to be Lauren's story. I then considered calling it Broken People because I want to... There are four main... Although some of them don't do very much, there are kind of four main characters in yeah. in the English Hikiki Kikamori. So you've got Freddie, you've got Lauren, um, you've got you got Kaz, the uh, the Japanese guy who he never actually meets in real life. Yeah. Um, but has clearly had his own issues. And then there's Jake, the one who whose whose boyfriend has just died. Yeah. Um, who's in an absolutely crap place as well. So I thought sticking those four characters in a house where they're not allowed to separate because of because of the rules, because of the pandemic, might be quite interesting. Mm. But it might be a bit depressing as well. <laughs> I don't know. Very so exactly. like symptomatic. Well, they're a very big bubble, then, is it basically? Yeah, um, and um, yeah, so so I don't know. I kind of I like all of the characters. I mean, f- for me, I, Jake as a character is a bit unsung, but it's actually him that knew how to press Freddie's buttons at the end yeah. to get him to talk. Yeah, you know, and it's a very brief moment, but because it's effectively the epilogue of the story. But Freddie's clamming up and still won't talk to anybody after surviving his suicide attempt, and and it's Jake. It's not Lauren who who's you know been in love with him or whatever for such a long time. It isn't yeah. Lauren that knows how to break him out of that. It's Jake. It's his it's his yeah. one of his best mates who just knows what to say to piss Freddie off to get a reaction out of him. Um, yeah. So I do think he's an, almost an unsung. I don't know about hero, but he's. There's more of a character there than than I think comes across. So I'd like to explore him more as well. So I mm. don't know is the honest. Thing. I don't know what I'm going to write next. I what, probably do. what are you going to do with the book? The what am I going to, the first book? So um, you're going to read it. Sorry. When are people going to be able to read it? I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm finishing it off, um, reading through it. Certainly, everything I read today, there's nothing I wanted to change. Hopefully, the rest of it is in that kind of condition so I can effectively sign it off as a, a finished work and then I don't know I'm a little bit worried about I'm a little bit worried about publishing it myself but because of your experience actually because one of the bits of feedback you got when you sent am I right to say this yeah I'm, I'm, well no well nobody actually said that to me it was just the impression I got possibly oh it. okay I thought you'd actually nobody be... actually specifically said it to me right but yeah, the fact that it had been published previously, I think to a degree, goes against it. Yeah. So, also, I do feel awesome because it is so different to the normal, sort of accepted standards of the genre. That again, that also goes against a little bit. But that's my story. That's not yours. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so my my current plan is to effectively finish it off. Um, which hopefully I'll do in the next month or two. Um, and then I am going to, if I can afford it, if I ever work again, um, buy the, um, what's that book, Monad? The writer's, no, the which one? Writer's and Writer's Year book. That one, buy that. Um, and then basically get my cover letter and my synopsis sorted and start sending it out to people because, like you say, it's not going to, it's not going to do anything sitting in a drawer or on a hard drive. Um, yeah. And my, my guess is it's going to be too dark for anybody to want to publish, but I'm not going to know that. Somebody might go... No, you won't. No, you need to just take that plunge. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, yes, yeah, so that that is my intention, is to actually... Good. <laughs> is I'll, to, hold, is hold, to, hold you to that one. Oh, you're, you're going to help me write? You're going to help me write the cover letter. <laughs> I am, I am. <laughs> if that's all right. Um, oh, yeah, fine, yeah. So, yeah, so, um, so yeah, I, I don't intend to do nothing with it, but um, I'm, I'm worried about self-publishing it. At least for now, because I, you need, I think um, you should explore. Um, well, when I wrote my the Curse client, I knew it couldn't be self published when I was writing it. I wasn't even going to consider sending it to somewhere else, right? So I want to have the control over the brand and control over the market and everything. But I think with Sage Jura, I think it's worth you send it off to agents and things first and see how that goes. 
Oh, absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. I, I absolutely do intend to do that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it a day there. Thank you so much cool. for taking the time to talk to me. Um, okay, my questions as well. I'm sure there's uh, <laughs> burning questions about your writing. Oh, I'm sure loads of people have loads of questions. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I've 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 done some special end credits. Um, yeah, it was very exciting. Don't don't go. I'll have a little chat with you once once um once we're off. But uh, thank okay. you. This will also be available. I think I'm going to send you a copy of this. I might not be able to actually because it's going to be bloody enormous. So I'm gonna, we'll have to find a way. Well, getting... We could do. You could just always cut it down so you can like um just when we start or just you can edit edit it as much as you want basically because yeah. I'll just do a, a kind of bridge version on um. But obviously, make sure you still include your questions at the end. Don't be editing them out. <laughs> <laughs> Tani, thank you so much. And good luck with the podcast and book five. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>